So now we'll discuss the Liberty timing models, which, as I mentioned before, are probably the heart of our standard cell library and the most important file that we have during synthesis. So an introduction to Liberty. So how do we know to delay through a gate in a logic path? Running SPICE is way too complex. If we would take each transistor and try to solve the uh, compact model equations that we get from SPICE, it would take a really, really long time. Instead, what we'll do is we'll create a more simplistic timing model that will very, very much simplify the calculation without um, getting too bad an estimation of what the timing is. So our goal is that we take every timing arc, and arc is... Uh, any path between an input and output, that's one arc, that's another arc. So for every timing arc, we will calculate two things. We will calculate the propagation delay. And again, a timing arc is not only the direction here, but it's also if we had a rising transition here when there was a, say, a one over here, what we're going to have is a rising transition on the output of this uh, uh, and. And if we had a falling transition, we'll have a falling transition on the output of this and. So each of those are separate timing arcs, and we have to um, calculate the uh, propagation delay of each of them. But not only that, we also want to calculate what the, um, uh, the rise or the fall time of the output transition is. So that's our goal with uh, our timing model. And what do we base this on? Well, our model is based on two simple um, factors. One is the rise or fall time, the transition at the input to the gate. And the other one is the load at the output of the gate. So given the transition at the input of the gate and the load at the output of the gate, we're going to calculate the TPD and the T-rise or T-fall at the output. So um, just a, a quick uh, important point here that I also did mention before, but it's really important. Um, but the, the actual TPD and T-rise and T-fall that we'll get are very dependent on the operating conditions. So it depends on if the transistors in here are fast or slow. It depends on the voltage that we connect here. We could put a higher supply voltage or a lower supply voltage. And it depends on things like the temperature. It would even depend on the extraction corner that we get the metals that we connect over here. So um, what we're going to do is actually run a characterization for uh, each of these standard cells at certain operating conditions. And each library we'll get will be characterized for a certain operating condition. And we'll usually be provided with several of these sets of operating conditions inside our standard cell library. And we have to decide which ones to, to run in order to, to meet our timing requirements. And we'll, uh, we'll discuss that in a later lecture. So general about the Liberty format. So we can see here kind of an overview of the Liberty format um, from a hierarchical level. And let's just dive into what we have inside. So at the beginning, we have this uh, keyword library and the name of the library, which almost always will have some sort of a description of our corner, such as the TT one volt, uh, 25 degrees Celsius that we had before, because we need to know what uh, corner it is when we're calling the file. It will also say that inside the header, um, the header data that we have inside here, the header data will have all kinds of things like general information that's common to all the cells in the library, wire load, lookup tables, and things that we'll discuss in a moment. Okay, then we go into the next level of hierarchy, which is a cell definition. For, so for every cell we have in our library, every standard cell, every size of standard cell, every VT option of standard cell, every type of sequential, each and every one of those standard cells will have this cell definition that will say the name and then have different attributes that we have for every one, so, such as their area, their function, and so forth. Okay, and then inside each cell will go into the important part, which is the pin uh, selection and the pin will describe for every pin um, information such as the capacitance, the timing, leakage, power, and so forth. Um, note already, I'll say it here, but we'll see it in a minute that all the timing and so forth are related to the output pins only. Okay, so diving deeper into that. Um, what is the, the actual timing model? So we said that what it has to get is the input transition, the output capacitance, and return to us the um, TPD and the T-rise, T-fall. So what we use uh, traditionally is called the nonlinear delay model, or NLDM. And as you can see here, what we're supposed to get is this kind of a table. The table has, in one uh, axis, it has the output loads in picofarads, and in on the other axis, we have input transitions. And we provide a list of these output loads and input transitions. And for each one of them, we run a SPI simulation. And we write down what our TPD, or T-rise, T-fall, or a power, or so forth, that we get at 
uh, through that spy simulation and we fill in this table that's described inside our lib file in uh, in a pair of ways first we have to describe what the accesses of our table are so that's with this lu table template and we call this table template delay template five, uh, five by five and we see the variable one this one is, or this one i guess is the input net transition variable two is the total output net capacitance and then we say what the the uh, values are so that would be these values that are along the line okay so now once we have a delay template we can use it inside every timing uh, um, description and in, inside every table that we use in in different pins so we have this cell called inverter x1 one of inside that we have the output pin is called y and inside there there's uh, uh, one of the things is called timing and inside timing there's cell rise delay so that's the tpd lh so the rising um, propagation delay we use this delay template that we had over in the header and then these are all the values that are inside the table over here okay now what do we do with all that um, we we're taking a driver model which is a ramp voltage source so we assume that our voltage source is it's a perfect voltage source that goes like this with a fixed drive resistance and second of all we have a receiver model where we say that this uh, receiver it's just a perfect capacitor that doesn't change um, during our transition and then we want to make a function that the TPD and the T-Rise T-Fall are a function of the input transition and the output load how do we do it well we just just interpolate the numbers here. We now know that our uh, our output load is say 0 0.075 picofarad, and our input transition is uh, also 0 0.075 picofarad. We go into the table. We don't find that exact number, so we take the values around it and interpolate and find what uh, a good nonlinear delay um, guess would be about that. So that is very very fast. We just use these lookup tables and do a, a real simple arithmetic um, uh, calculation. Um, it doesn't at all matter cap variation during transition, and that's really bad because lower than about 130 nanometers, it loses accuracy. Um, so just an uh, example of how this type of a thing works. So let's see. We have uh, an input transition of 0.1 nanoseconds, and uh, we have a capacitor on the output, and we have a different type of a transition that we see somewhere else is a, 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 um, a high to low transition at the input um, uh, of 0.12 nanoseconds. So when we want to see, for example, uh, the rise will cause TPD HL will cause a cell fall. So we want to see what the TPD is. We go to this table called cell fall. Right, and we see 0.1 nanoseconds. Hmm, where does that fall? It falls somewhere in between this and this, right? And the output load is one is uh, one picofarad. It's somewhere in between here. So it's in between these four squares, and we interpolate and we find out that the actual number should be 0.178 nanoseconds. So we found that the propagation delay was the uh, was 0.178 nanoseconds we also want to see the t fall so there we go to the table called fall transition it again will fall in this uh, foursome of, uh, of numbers and we see that it's 0.147 nanoseconds if we wanted to see the tpd for the rising where this went down and this will go up we'll go to this table and find out what it is so that's kind of how the linear delay nonlinear delay models work but we said it's not very accurate so what uh, happened is several years ago, both uh, Cadence and Synopsys came up with their own formats. Uh, the Synopsys format is called CCS or Concurrent Current Source. And the, um, the Cadence model is called ECSM. Um, and, uh, and these model uh, the nonlinear output behavior uh, as a current source. So we again have a model for a driver. Um, so the, the driver here is a nonlinear current source and we have the model for a receiver and the receiver is a changing capacitance and this gives us a, a lot better um, estimation. In fact, at least in, in a bit older technologies, it was in, within 2% of uh, spice. You need some more values, you need a bit more calculation, but it is essential to use today. So you're supposed to only use these types of models with anything below something like a 100 nanometer process. Okay, uh, just to, to, to point that out, what the difference is between these nonlinear delay models and the concurrent current source, the, the details don't really matter that much. But if in our nonlinear delay model, our receiver model was just this uh, input capacitance, uh, or uh, uh, that was all our receiver was, 
what we had on our output load was just this single value of, uh, of a capacitor. Um, when we go over to one of these uh, current source models, our uh, our capacitor uh, capacitance changes along the way, and so therefore, for every input slew and output cap, we have a different value for this area of our C1 and our area of C2, and these are taken into account when calculating the delay. Uh, second, when we take our um, our driver model, um, what we had before for uh, for uh, what we had before is we just had uh, a standard input slews and they would give us our numbers. Here we have a uh, changing current source for each uh, uh, pair of input slew and output cap. So it's a much more complex model and it's much more accurate. Um, good question is, okay, we can take a, some sort of a gate that we have along the way and we see that it's uh, driving all kinds of other gates over here. And we can say, aha, each one of these has an input capacitance that we know. And we can know then, and we know the uh, intrinsic output capacitance here, so we know what the C load is, right? But what about the wire, right? Are we going to just uh, neglect the wire? Well, that wouldn't be too smart. So, because the wire is often now dominant. But what do we do at the synthesis level when we don't know anything uh, about the, the actual uh, parasitics that we have? So, how do you estimate the parasitics of a net before placement and routing? And the answer is what we do is we use something called a wire load model, or at least we used to use something called a wire load model. And it actually was a very bad estimation, but that is what was done. This is how a wire load model is described in a, in a Liberty file. And you may have several of them, and you can choose which wire load model you want to use. Um, but I'll tell you the truth, it doesn't really matter because it's really poor estimation. How did they guess what the wire load here was? Well, they counted what the fan out was. In this case, the fan out is two. So they would go to one of these tables, they look, mm, fan out is two. Then that means the resistance of this wire is 0 0.01295 and the capacitance is 0 0.00812. Just according to the resistance. Just let me give you an example of why that's very inaccurate. Well, let's say I have a chip and inside the chip, I have an inverter and the inverter has lots of these other guys. Maybe it, it's driving four other uh, inverters that are right by and I go into this table and I see that the uh, resistance is 0 0.02 and the capacitance is 0 0.018, right? But then again, I have another inverter over here and this inverter is driving another inverter on the other side of the chip over here. But what is its fan out? Its fan out is one. So we see that it, the, the estimation is that the uh, resistance and capacitance of this this net is, um, well, it's about five times the size as this resistance, and it's about six times the size of that capacitance, even though obviously this net would be much worse in terms of capacitance and resistance. So this uh, guessing through fan out what the resistance and capacitance are is not a very good um, is not a very good way to do it. That's why uh, nowadays we should use physical aware synthesis, which um, actually goes and does some sort of a placement and merges placement into our uh, synthesis flow. So what we do is in synopsis, it's called topographical mode in cadence, it's called physical synthesis. And um, there are uh, several uh, options of how to run this. Uh, uh, you have to look into the documentation of each tool to see. But for example, if we run uh, sin opt minus physical, it will run physical aware synthesis in cadence genus. And what it does, it takes the left files and does some sort of a placement inside. And if you're already on a later iteration after you've done at least one iteration of place and route, you can import a floor plan as a, a dot def file, a def file. And uh, that will tell uh, the, the, the tool what the floor plan is. It will actually run a whole placement run and then it will get much better um, parasitic extraction to, to, to base its wire load models upon.